So we've looked at where fear emerges from, and we saw it comes out of this huge cauldron of many kinds of things. Some are instinctual, some are neurotic, some are healthy, some are unhealthy. And then we tried to distinguish between healthy fear and unhealthy fear. And now I want to look at some principles taken from Scripture, and particularly from Jesus in the New Testament, that invite us to live with less religious fear in our lives. Principles that invite us to live with less religious fears. And to kind of set a tone for this, I want to read you a quote from Marilyn Robinson, her book, When I Was a Child, I Read Books, where she talks about fear as being unworthy of Christianity. She says, Fear and antagonism do nothing to draw respect to Christianity and our churches. And to the extent that we let them be associated with Christianity, we risk defacing Christianity in the world's eyes. Why all this fear if we believe that Christianity is the deepest of all truth and believe that Christ will be with us till the end of time? Christianity is too great a narrative to be reduced to serving any parochial interest or to be underwritten by any lesser tale. Reverence should forbid, in particular, its being subordinated to tribalism, resentment, or fear. Making God a tribal deity or a local God is embarrassing and disgraceful. Fear is unworthy of Christianity. I think in many ways she, she captures the essence of what I want to say during, the next, during this next session. Fear is unworthy of Christianity. In the first letter of John, there's a passage where John says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment, and one who fears is not yet made perfect in love. There is no fear in love. I want to begin these principles in terms of um, having less fear of God with what one central image in Christianity, and it's the central image of all its Christianity, the image of the cross, the cross of Christ. What's revealed in the cross of Christ precisely reveals to us the God of love for whom there should be no fear. Let's look at that. At the moment of Christ's death, we have this very powerful piece of scripture, which at first sight is kind of hard to see the positives in it. But in the Synoptic Gospels, they say, Jesus died. And remember when that's read in our churches, they say, then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And then there's this powerful moment of silence for a moment. Then we stand up and the lecturer keeps reading. The lecturer says, and then the curtain veil was ripped from top to bottom and the graves opened up and the saints began to walk around. That's powerful and beautiful apocalyptic imagery. What does it mean that the curtain veil was ripped from top to bottom? The curtain veil was what? The curtain veil was the veil that separated ordinary people from seeing into the Holy of Holies. So that if you went into the Jewish temple, the ordinary people could go into the first part of the temple, and then there was a huge veil, and behind that veil only the priests could go in what's called the Holy of Holies, and ordinary people could not go behind it, but only the priests. Now, what the evangelists are saying in this beautiful imagery, they say, Jesus' death, the cross of Christ, rips away the veil that prevents us from seeing into the inside of God. Ordinary people, through the prism of the cross, can see into the inside of God, and what they see is spectacularly beautiful. We see God as love. Now, to get that, you want to take its counterpart in the Jewish scriptures. You know, in the Jewish scriptures, you have that beautiful passage where uh, and it's, it's the image of the rainbow. In the Old Testament, the image of the cross is the image of the rainbow. And see, the rainbow works this way as a divine symbol. The scriptures tell us God is light. But it's interesting, you don't see light. We see by light, but we don't see light. So right now you're seeing by light, but you're not seeing light. And you can never see light except in one place. And that is if you bring a prism into the room. So a prism, a piece of crystal, will refract light. It breaks light open, and you see the inside of light. And actually when you see the inside of light, you see that it's spectacularly beautiful. You see these seven primal colors in the rainbow. So that light, which you normally can't see, is refracted and broken open by a prism, which helps you see its inside, which is spectacularly beautiful. 
That's the image the Gospels want you to get about the cross. What the cross does, it's the prison, it breaks open, it tears the veil, and you see what's inside of God, and what you see inside of God is spectacularly beautiful. God is love, unconditional love, um, and, and that's what's revealed, and of that we need to be in reverence, we need to be respectful, we need to be patient. It's a wonderful new book by a Czech writer called Thomas Halik called Patience with God, and he says, atheism is simply another word for somebody who hasn't got enough patience with God. Mm -hmm. So we're invited to be patient, but we're not invited to fear this reality at all. You don't fear what unconditionally loves you. You don't live in some morbid fear of punishment or whatever. Okay, that's the central image. God is love, which is revealed in the cross. What the cross does, basically the cross of Christ says, um, you can crucify God, you can do anything, and God doesn't stop loving you for one second. You can crucify God, but God doesn't stop loving you for one second. So now, let's look at those principles. The first one, God's insight, God's understanding, God's compassion, and God's forgiveness infinitely surpass our own. I'll come back on the story I told you this morning of the woman at the funeral of this young man who died tragically. And she said, if I were running the gates of heaven, I would let him in. Well, so the person running the gates of heaven, God, is infinitely more compassionate more understanding, uh, more forgiving, more grasping of a situation than we are. The safest hands we're ever in are in God's hands. People can misunderstand you. The people you most love can misunderstand you. God never misunderstands you. People can not forgive your faults. God forgives our faults. People can uh, not grasp why you're doing certain actions. Or people cannot grasp how your wounds contribute to certain actions or what immaturities are and so on. Um, God gets it. You know, anthropologists tell us this, and I agree with them, although I've never been a grandparent. But they say the purest experience of love on this side of eternity is not the experience we experience inside of marriage or an intimate love. It's actually the love of a grandparent for a young grandchild. And those of you who are grandparents, you get this. You know, imagine you're a grandparent, and you walk into a nursery, and here's a day-old baby lying behind um, glass or being held by her mother. Do you think there's anything that baby can do that would offend you? <laughs> you know, you, you couldn't. I know Richard Rohr likes to say, we flatter ourselves when we say we can offend God. The same as, you know, this baby can't offend its grandparents. God is love, and God is perfect love, and perfect compassion, and perfect understanding. We are in completely safe hands with God. And that's important and very, very consoling to know, especially in, uh, not just for our own lives, but particularly for the lives of people we know who, who die, who live, and sometimes die in very tragic situations. People who commit suicide, people who die, and in situations where on the surface that's not the way you want to exit the planet, but to always know they're in much safer, more loving, compassionate hands than ours. You know, those of you who are parents or grandparents or, or in families where you've lost a member and sometimes in less than ideal way, you understand this person, um, they'd be safe in your hands while God's hands are infinitely safer. We have far too much fear about who's going to heaven and who isn't and who God is letting in. Um, we let our own projections and our own rules and our own guilt comp complexes compromise God. Um, we are never in safer hands than God's hands. Never in more loving hands, never in more gentle hands, never in more understanding hands than God's. And if we know that, it can undercut a lot of our fears, not just for ourselves, but for our kids, for our world and so on. God is an understanding parent. You know, understanding parents, they know their kids and sometimes they shake their heads in frustration about some of the immaturities of the kids, but they understand that. God is probably shaking his or her head sometimes about some of the stupid things we do, but God understands it and God forgives it. 
Secondly, God is a prodigal God. What does that mean? I want to begin with a parable. Um, there are so many parables in Scripture about God's prodigalness, but let's take this one. Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a sower. A sower went out to seed, and the sowers, as he sower seeds, some seed fell on the road, some fell in the ditch, some fell on ground where the birds came and ate it, some fell on shallow ground where it grew and then the, the sun came and withered it, other seed fell into uh, uh, the bushes where it got choked out, and some fell on good soil and yielded 30 and 60 and 100 fold. Now, there's many things to this parable, but one of the, the, the central things to the parable is the lavishness and prodigalness of God. I grew up on a farm. No farmer sows like that. My dad hadn't grown them seed into the ditch, into the bushes, into the trees, just <laughs> because my dad had limited seed. God has unlimited seed. So God's, it's, it, notice the prodigalness of this God. It's just a seed. It's going all over. Most of it's being wasted and it doesn't seem to affect God. Um, God has so much there's so much prodigalness that God is just lavishing it out. Some will be wasted. Much will be wasted. A lot of lives will be wasted. God can deal with that. God is a prodigal God. Some years ago, and it's still a wonderful book to read, but find a book by Barbara Kingsolver, and it's called Prodigal Summer. It's a beautiful, it's a very earthy book, a very sensual book in, in the wide sense of sensuality. But she writes this book set in the Appalachian Mountains, on a given summer um, where it's just hot and wet and fertile and everything gets pregnant that summer. <laughs> the you know, women get pregnant, the bees, the cattle, everything. You know, it's just, and it's called prodigal summer. You know, it's a wonderful image of God. God is this prodigal God and everything about Jesus and everything that's revealed in the, about the God in the Jewish scriptures is about God's lavishness and the opposite of scarcity. See, one of the things we struggle with, which gives us a lot of fears, is that we are perennially dealing with scarcity. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough time. We don't have enough love. We don't have enough forgiveness. We don't have enough whatever it is we don't have enough of. So we're always dealing with scarcity, and then we project that onto God. If God loves Catholics, then how can God love Protestants? And if God loves Christians, how can God also love Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims and, and New Age people? And if God loves pro-life people, how can God love pro-choice people? And how can this and so on? And if God loves us when we're good, how can God love us when we're bad? You know, it's, that's always a fear of scarcity, you know, of cheap grace, that somehow God is going to run out of it. And the scriptures assure us God is infinite, infinite in love, infinite in goodness, infinite in resources. And today we're only beginning to discover the prodigalness of this universe. You know, the universe itself, the physical universe that we know, absolutely boggles the mind in its immensity and its non-prodigalness. You know, there's just throwaway galaxies and billions of planets and expanding universes and so on. Our, our mind can't even grasp it, you know. And in fact, the irony is we might be the only people in all of this. So what's all this space and billions of light years and billions of galaxies? Each of us could have our own galaxy. What, and I'm not talking about a car or a cell phone. You know? <laughs> Tell God I want a billion planets I want to own and so on. And there's lots of it out there. See, God is a prodigal God, isn't operating out of scarcity. And so we can make mistakes. We can do huge wrong things in our life. Some of our kids will die tragically and so on. Um, but we always live with the great lines from Jesus, all will be redeemed, or as Julian F. Norwich so wonderfully put it, in the end all will be well, and all will be well, and every manner of being will be well. And see, it invites us to live with less fear. It also invites us to live with less sense of scarcity. You know, um, you know there are many benefits if you grew up poor. I grew up poor. Many of you grew up, you know, poverty and so on. You learn to be frugal and to appreciate and so on. But the negative side is you also always think out of scarcity. There's not enough. 
and if I get it, then somebody else can't have it, and this, and if, if God loves us, he can't love somebody else, and so on. Uh, how can God love all these billions and billions of people? Um, because God is infinite, and we aren't. We live with the prodigal God, and it's very, a lot of our fears die when we get this. Just the lavishness, and it's also God is prodigal in God's love. God is simply unconditional love and forgiveness. Thirdly, God is a God of complete nonviolence, non coercion, non threat. God is an invitational God. Um, let me tell you, just use a story from Scripture that's just wonderful in illustrating this. If somebody says to me um, about the nonviolence of God, I always start with this story. And it's a late story in Scripture, it's in the Gospel of John. And as you know, John's Gospel is one of the latest books, the last books ever written in Scripture. It might have been written you know, in the year 90 or the year 100. Jesus has been dead and gone for 65 years. And the beloved disciple writes this book. But the incidents he records, one of them is, is just this incredible story that has about three or four levels of meaning to it. And it's the story of the woman who's caught in adultery. And they bring her to Jesus. And Jesus is going to teach us a lesson about fear and non-fear and God with the story. So they bring her to Jesus. They said they made her stand in the middle. They're shaming her. See, they, they, when, when you're standing in the middle, you can't get your back to any wall. And they say to Jesus, we caught this woman in the very act of committing adultery. And Moses said to stone people like that to death. What do you say? Well, first of all, there's a sidebar you can ask here. What about the man? Where is he? But anyway. Um, that was the times. Maybe it hasn't changed all that much. But anyway, um, the woman, she's there. So they said, what do you say? So Jesus doesn't say anything. They said Jesus bent down, looked at the ground. So he's not looking at the woman. And he begins to write with his finger on the ground. And they persist. Then Jesus said, let the person without sin cast the first stone. Then a remarkable turnaround. John said, they all put down their stones and walked away one by one, beginning with the eldest. Then Jesus turns to the woman and says, nobody condemned you. She said, no. He said, neither do I. He said, go. Very important verb. Go and don't sin anymore. Okay, let's look at this text. There's a remarkable range of stuff in this text. Okay, they bring the woman to her and they said, we caught her in the very act of committing adultery. Hang on to the language. They said, and Moses said we should stone women like that to death. What do you say? Jesus doesn't say anything. He begins to write on the ground with his finger. Now, what is he writing? Well, scholars tell you it's not important what he's writing. And don't try to guess what he's writing. Um, it's the gesture. Who writes with his finger on, on it's God. God writes with his finger and God writes twice. Jesus is going to write twice with his finger. Because in John's Gospel, Jesus is God all the time. God writes with his finger. And what does God write? He writes the Ten Commandments. And why does he have to write them twice? Because Moses broke them the first time. See, Moses goes up the hill, and God writes with his fingers the Ten Commandments into tablets of stone. Moses brings him down the hill, and as he comes down the hill, he approaches the camp, and he catches the people in the very act of committing idolatry. There's only one vowel difference. So Moses is carrying, you want to get this image, it's a powerful metaphor and irony. Moses is carrying God's law physically. And he comes down and he catches the people breaking God's law. So what does he do? He broke the commandments physically over their heads and over the gold calf. So you don't want to miss the irony. Moses was the first person to break the Ten Commandments. <laughs> you know, uh, he hadn't even promulgated them yet. And he broke them, and he broke them physically over people's heads. Okay, and then because he did that, he had to go back up the hill and get it written a second time. But before God wrote him a second time, he gave Moses a very strong lecture about, he says, I'm a God of nonviolence. Don't stone people in my name. Don't use the commandments to stone people. Now, I'll go back to the people with the woman. They come and said, Moses said to stone people like that to death. But notice, to do it in your name, to do violence in God's name. And Jesus, with his gesture, is telling him, you might want to think about Moses. He was the first person to get it wrong. Moses got it wrong because he used God's law and he used divine fervor to kill people, to, to stone people. And he's saying with the gesture, 
don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do violence in God's name. And we've done it through the centuries and we still do it. Let me tell you a story here and see if you pick up the powerful irony in this story. Captain Cook. And Captain Cook wasn't a Disney character. He was a real guy. <laughs> and he did sail the world. At one stage, he stayed for three years in the Polynesian Islands. And he learned the language, befriended the chief. And one day, the chief took Captain Cook where they did a human sacrifice. They sacrificed the man on an altar. And Cook, who was a very sophisticated Englishman, he was horrified. And he told the chief, he said, that's terrible. That's awful. He said, you're a primitive people. In England, we'd hang you for that. <laughs> okay. 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 A little slow, but yet the irony. See, we call it capital punishment, but we're still using God to kill somebody. We're still taking the commandments and killing people in God's name, which induces a certain kind of fear. Okay. And what, what's revealed through Jesus is that God is a God of complete nonviolence. God doesn't stone you with the commandments. Incidentally, there's a beautiful ending to this text. Then Jesus turns to the woman. Now, he hasn't looked at her yet. And the reason, he doesn't look at you in your shame. When she's being shamed, he doesn't look at her. Then he turns and looks at the woman, and he says, nobody condemned you? She said, no, he says, go. Now, why is that an important verb? That is the verb that God used when he set the Israelites free from Egypt. And finally said to Pharaoh, let my people go. He's releasing her into freedom. Freedom from her shame, but especially freedom from her sin. And then we have a bad English translation. The English translation says, go and don't sin anymore. Really, um, sin means to miss the mark. He says, go, I'm setting you free. Don't miss the mark the next time. You know, and that's Jesus sending us away from our sin. But, but that beautiful verb, he says, go. That's God setting his people free. He's releasing her into freedom. He, he's releasing her from her fears and her shame, whereas notice the crowd was trying to stone her and kill her and hold her inside of that, of that shame and inside of her sin and so on. And they were trying to do it in God's name. Now, when we realize that, a lot of our religious fears will go away. See, we're, we, we, we still fear somehow a violent God. We still fear a punishing God. We, 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 we fear a God who's somehow going to extract an ounce of blood for every sin we took. And we're meeting a God. There's no, you know that wonderful text from Isaiah we read, you know, come to the water, buy food, buy honey, buy milk. There's no price. No price. It's free. Go. Notice Jesus didn't say like him, you've sinned, and I'm really thinking whether I should let you go. He's, he's setting her free, out of captivity. Sin is a captivity. God wants to release us from sin. Go. Um, you know, God is also a non-coercion, a non-threat. Anything that is a mature adult woman or man threatens you does not come from God, even if it has a religious label. God is not saying, do this or you're going to have eternal punishment. Do this or you're going to suffer and so on. You know what God is? Don't picture God that way. Picture God as God is in front of you, leading you. Michael Hines is a wonderful theologian at Boston College. He always gives this image. He says, you know, have you ever watched a mother or an adult trying to coax a little kid that's learning how to walk a toddler across the room? And they're just out of the fingertips of the kid and they're coaching, you can do another step, and they're just backing away and pulling the kid back. That, that's God. God is always that loving, non-coercive, non-threatening force that's in front of us, coaxing us. And that isn't just Michael Hines' image. That's the image of Scripture. Notice how God was born into the world. They wanted a superstar, somebody coming down here with blazing machine guns who's going to laser all the bad, you know, all the Hollywood heroes, Bruce Willis, Sylvester Stallone, you know, um, all these you know, John Wayne heroes who come and just clean up the world with violence. And what did they get? They got a baby in the straw, a baby that couldn't even change its own diaper, couldn't feed itself. That's God's presence in the world. Um, I always tell students, and I don't think I'm wrong on this, so I see the God we meet is thoroughly underwhelming. <laughs> see, see, false gods always overwhelm you with something. They overwhelm you with 
You sometimes say, why doesn't God just walk in here and prove that God is God and do a miracle and make this lectern disappear and do a few things? Then nobody would have any faith. I mean, would need, nobody would have to have faith. He could just believe in God because that's not the way God works. That's the way magicians work. It's the way dictators work. That's the way false heroes work. They just overwhelm you. And notice God, the whole history of God is it's underwhelming. Jesus is born in the most underwhelming way. A baby in a barn outside of town, nobody wants him. Um, can't change his own clothes, can't feed himself. That's God's presence in the world. Completely unthreatening. Babies don't frighten you. They don't scare you. Um, in fact, they make you clean up their act. You know, people, even though the baby can't hear, hard people stop swearing around babies. <laughs> See, babies, they exert, they're, they're exert, exorcists. They're the best exorcists in the whole world. People watch their behavior and watch what they say around the baby because it's completely powerless. That's God's presence in the world. And you know, you're not afraid of a baby. I mean, you're afraid of harming a baby. We need not be afraid of God. Okay, then God respects our nature, our makeup, and our innate propensities. This is a very important prong, and I always find it hard to explain this. Um, but it's a very important one. See, now we're, we're, as human beings, we are creatures of the flesh in this sense, that we're, we're sensual creatures in the real meaning of the word sensuality, in this sense that, you know, we have five senses. We see, feel, touch, taste, and smell, and mostly that's what's real to us, you know, and each other, we're real to us, our celebrations, our humanity, our births, our deaths, and so, you know, our, our barbecues, they're <laughs> radically real to us. Okay, um, the Holy Spirit is less real to us. Okay, now sometimes we're giving the impression that God made us with all this propensity for humanity and so on, but that God wants us to completely step out of that and become something else. You know, a couple of years ago I went to a funeral of a man who died in his mid 60s, mid 60s, died of a heart attack, died quite suddenly without a lot of preparation. <clears throat> But a wonderfully loved man. This was a guy who, um, he was kind and fun-loving and generous and a good father and a good neighbor and the type of person who would get, take the shirt off your back and give it to you. But, but, and he enjoyed sports and he had all his favorite teams and he uh, enjoyed having his beer, watching his football game and so on. Um, but he, he was a, a neighbor and a man and a father you'd order from a catalog. <coughs> But on the surface, he wasn't all that spiritual, you know. He went to church because well, Sunday's a good guy, goes to church and so on. And he prayed when he had to pray because that's what people do. And he died like that. He was a saint. You know, you think God made him. Well, all this, you know, he loved his, his sports and his barbecue and all, his wife and his kids and so on. And that he was supposed to somehow be free of all of that to be somehow be some spiritual mystic. And sometimes we're always afraid that, you know, what God makes us with all these... Uh, um, you know, just propensities and appetites for human things, and then that somehow we're afraid we're supposed to have stepped out of this. And sometimes spiritual literature, which isn't really sensitive sometimes, gives you the impression that you, you somehow have to become other than what you are. That God makes you human, and then God wants you to be an angel to go to heaven. Well, uh, I always tell people, angelology is an entirely different thing than anthropology. Why? Because angels don't have bodies. Angels don't get tired, they don't get sick, they don't get emphysema, they don't get anything, you know. You know, um, they don't have to go to the bathroom, they have very different problems than we have, you know. And they're not interested in your sports teams and so on. We are, you know. And that's healthy. Don't be afraid of your humanity. You know, the great theologians from Augustine through Thomas Aquinas through whatever, they always say, grace builds on nature. It's a wonderful line. Grace builds on nature. It doesn't, you don't have to somehow become something other than what you are to be a saint. You know, become a good, full human being. And that's, that's sanctity. And sometimes we're always afraid that that, doesn't, that that doesn't cut it. That somehow we have to be beyond. Let me give you a line. I wasn't really sure what to do with this when I first heard it, but some years ago at a seminar in, at a university in Ottawa, 
and they had a speaker, Vivienne Labrie, French-Canadian, wonderful woman who does social work on the streets of Quebec City, Catholic, Christian. But she was giving a talk to theologians and she confessed she was pretty intimidated by speaking to theologians and she isn't a theologian. But she said this at one point, she says, you know, I work for the poor and I work for the, for the, the poor on the streets in Quebec City, she says, and I do it because I'm a Christian. She said, I'm doing this for Christ. She said, but I can go for two years on the streets and never mention Christ's name. She said, not that I'm ashamed of being a Christian. She said, I think that God is mature enough that he doesn't always need to be the center of our conscious attention. She said, God isn't some petty parent. Have you talked about me lately? You know, <laughs> God is like a wonderful grandparent who at the barbecue, they want to hear everybody else's story, you know. Um, God is happy when we're happy. Um, so God made us in this earthy, fleshy humanity and God wants us to move towards God in this earthy, fleshy humanity. Um, don't fear your humanity. Um, it's one of the principles to give up our fear of God. Then, God is a blessing parent, not a threatened parent. I told you this morning just a couple of uh, brief Greek stories, you know, the myth of Prometheus who stole fire from the gods. But you know, if you've ever heard the story of the, the great Greek god, god, Kronos, from which we get the word chronology, the god of time, but Kronos was an ancient Greek god, but Kronos was a threatened father. So Kronos was married to Gaia, um, from which we know land from, and every time she'd have a baby, his child, he would wait by the womb and as soon as the, the baby came out, he'd eat the child. Because he was always afraid that the child would grow up and displace him. So that, uh, there's a lot to this story, you know. Uh, I always tell my students, fish aren't the only species that eats their young. We do it too, you know. But see, Kronos is always threatened by his own children, so he'd kill his own children. He'd eat his own children so his children could never be a threat to him. That's an unconscious thing we carry about God. You know, the, the Greeks just expressed it in their myths that somehow um, our creativity, the things we do, that somehow that's in a threat and it's a threat and an affront to God. So that we, we are, um, we're somehow not, we're threatening God by our own achievements. <clears throat> now, that's completely foreign to scripture. Um, it's interesting that it would need a lot of qualification because when we have what we call the seven deadly sins, the first sin is the sin of pride. So that we can do, in fact, do things that set us and set our humanity against God. Um, but oftentimes, particularly for sensitive Christians, that is not the issue. For sensitive people, it's oftentimes the opposite. That we, in fact, live most of our lives in a certain depressive fear that we're in a certain depression because we're afraid of our own internal resources. We're afraid of our own talents. So notice in there, um, when you keep that in mind and read the parable of the talents. This is one of the, the parables that we, we rarely preach on in scripture because we don't know what to do with it. But Jesus said there was a king and he went off to a foreign land and he was kind of a fearful king. And he gave one person 10 talents won five talents and won one talent. And he went away and he came back some years later and the guy with the 10 talents came and he says, I took your money and I worked with it and I made 10 more talents. And the king said, well done and I'm gonna put you in charge of a couple of whole kingdoms. And the man with the five talents came, same thing. I, I put this money to work and now I've made five more talents. And he says, bravo. And he said, you're gonna take over five major cities as king. And the last person came and said, you gave me one talent and I was afraid. I was really afraid of you, so I buried the talent. So here it is, unused, and he gets punished. He said, take it away and give it to the one who has ten. And he says, as for him, throw him out in the darkness to be weeping and grinding of teeth. What's in there? You know, we can't be afraid. Notice the first person said, because I was afraid of you. I mean, the one with the one talent. I was afraid, so I hid the talent. I was afraid of you. He's talking to, this is us talking to God. I didn't use my talents because I was afraid of you. 
God is not that pleased with that, except he doesn't have to punish us, we punish ourselves. You know what happens when we don't eat our talents, use our talents? We end up mourning and weeping and grinding our teeth. We end up unhappy, frustrated, you know, how come I never get a break and so on. Um, that's always, and that's based on fear. Fear to, to be who God made us to be. Sixth, God does not demand certain prior moral conditions to dine with us, God's presence is forgiveness. That's a, an interesting statement and a biblical one. You know, there's, there's a heresy. Let me start and I'll work back from that. There's a heresy called Jansenism. And Jansenism is always with us in one form or another, but uh, in the early part of the last century, and really into the 1950s, it was really, really strong. Um, and see, Jansenism is a heresy that masks itself as piety and fear of the Lord. So if someone says, you know, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to go to church. I'm not worthy to go to communion. Or, and, or, or sometimes it gets judgmental, and these people aren't worthy to go to communion. That, you know, unless you're, in, you're really right, you shouldn't be going to church. You shouldn't be going to communion. And, and in fact, it was a time in the church where, where people going to communion really dropped down radically. And then, to his credit, it was Pius X who came up and said, no, that's a heresy. You, you, you need to go to communion when you go to church and so on. Well, we have this sense that somehow we have to meet prior moral conditions in order to dine with Jesus. Now look at Scripture. Does Jesus ever demand that? No. Notice Jesus sits down with sinners while they're still sinners. And notice he's also challenged, too. People say, why do you dine with sinners? It's quite a text. They said, or they said to the apostles, your master dines with sinners. So they say to Jesus, why do you dine with sinners? And remember that powerful answer he's given, which we've never appropriated. Jesus says, why do I dine with sinners? He said, because I've come for sinners. He said, it's not the well who need the doctor. It's the sick who need the doctor. Let me tell you a little story here. When I was living in Edmonton, there was a Presbyterian minister there called, with a wonderful name for a minister called Billy Graham. And that's the name you ordered from a catalog, you know. But he was worthy of his name. And one day in class he shared this story. He says, you know, um, and he was pastor of Brayside Presbyterian Church in Edmonton. He said, I was in a store recently, he said, and a young man came up to me and he says, you know, pastor, I know who you are. You're Reverend Graham from Brayside Presbyterian. He says, and I belong to your church. He said, but I don't go. So the reason I don't go is because I know the people there and they're hypocrites. <laughs> and so Billy says to him, well, you could come too. He said, uh, there would be room for another one. Uh, <laughs> but that wasn't his best line. He said, young man, he said, T I take that as a, an ex a very wonderful compliment. He says, I am trying to run a church just for hypocrites. I am trying to run a church just for hypocrites. That's exactly what Jesus said. He said, I've come for sinners. I haven't come for the righteous. Okay. Incidentally, there's a very neat little motif that plays out in Luke's Gospel. See, in Luke's Gospel, Jesus says so often, I've come for sinners. I haven't come for the righteous, which can spark a question inside of you. Does Jesus love sinners better than righteous people? Seems to. He says, I've come for sinners. I haven't come for the righteous. Where does it leave the righteous? Well, it's a trick question. Because for Jesus, it's not that Jesus loves sinners more than uh, Jesus loves sinners more than righteous people, but it's not two kinds of people. There are only sinners. There are no righteous people. So Jesus loves sinners who admit they're sinners. <laughs> See, everybody's a sinner, but some of us don't admit it, and we pretend to be righteous. It's harder for a forgiving God to forgive us because we don't want to be forgiven. So it's a trick question, isn't that Jesus loves sinners more than righteous people? In Luke's gospel other than Mary and Jesus, there are no righteous people. There are only sinners. Sinners who admit it and sinners who don't. Everybody is astray. So Jesus said, uh, I've, but I've come for sinners. Now the reason that's so important, of all the things I want to talk about, this is so important because today we have thousands of people who don't go to church precisely because the churches aren't radiating this right and we're not getting into it. So what happens? Their lives fall apart. 
kids, they start living outside of church rules and people's marriages fall apart, then they stay away from church until they get their lives together, then they come back, you know, which seems to imply that as if going to church and going to communion is a moral statement. See, when I'm worthy, I can go to church. And when I'm worthy, I can go to communion. That's false. You go to communion because you're not worthy. You go to church because we're not worthy. See, so fear causes this huge havoc. It's a little bit many of you are parents and grandparents. Well, whatever your kids are doing, you want them to come home. And in fact, if they're, if they're in trouble, you particularly want them to come home. God is the great parent. Loving God. God wants us to come home. He wants us to come to church. He wants us to receive him precisely because we need the help. It's not after you clean the house that you call the cleaners in. You know, it's the fact that we're doing. We first try to get our house clean, then we call in the great cleaner. Jesus is the great, Jesus cleans our moral life. We go to communion because we're not worthy. We go to church because we're not worthy, not because we are worthy. And it's just so clear, scripture scholars point that out, that you see that so, so clearly. Jesus sits down with sinners and dines with them while they're sinners. Or a scripture scholar who's a friend of mine, he, he tries to make this point really strongly. He always says, notice, Jesus gave Judas communion at the Last Supper. You know, Jesus gave Judas communion. He knew he had Judas already betrayed him. Jesus gave communion to Judas at the Last Supper. Um, Jesus loves us while we're sinners. He sits down and dines with us while we're sinners. Number seven, God is completely trustworthy, faithful, and safe surrender. Now, I've kind of spoken about this, but I'll just highlight it a little bit. <clears throat> Whenever I preach at, when I have to, and, and I write on this, every year I do a major article on suicide. And I've had to, to preach a number of times at, you know, at funerals that were just really, truly tragic. Not, not that I'm ever worried about the eternal salvation of this person, but the way this person died um, is, is a burden on the family. On, you know, it's not the way you want to exit the planet. And you always can tell that people are they're nervous or they're anxious. What about this person? And, and is, did they commit the unforgivable sin against the Holy Spirit? Did they despair? Did they despair? Or sometimes people who just die in tragic events, they're trying to kill somebody and somebody kills them. And, um, or kids who die and you know, drug overdose and they've been away from the church and all kinds of things like that. Um, I always tell people this, look, don't worry. This person is in much safer hands than ours. They're in much gentler hands than ours. You know, when, 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 a, when a baby's born normally, they're put into their mother's arms. And uh, now that the baby, this is quite an experience being born. <laughs> First time they've seen light and so on. But they're in the hands of a wonderfully gentle person who loves them. When we die, uh, take this and multiply it by 50 times. We're in the gentlest, safest, tenderest, forgiving hands we've ever encountered in our lives. And it doesn't matter how we die, through suicide, through murder, through whatever, uh, we're in God's arms, and those are safe arms. And to realize that just undercuts so many fears in our lives. Um, you know, well, maybe this person's in hell or whatever, and they're in God's arms. Um, we needn't worry. Then number eight, God is a jealous God who desires our salvation and the salvation of our loved ones more than we do. Now, there's a consoling thought for you. You know, we want to go to heaven, uh, but God wants us to go to heaven more than we want to get there. We want our kids to live good lives. We want them to go to heaven, and sometimes we can't help them. They're belligerent, and they're not taking it from us, and so on. They can walk away from you. There's somebody they can never walk away from. You know, God wants the salvation of your kids and their lives a million times more than you do. You know, and even though you want it strongly, God wants your salvation more strongly than you do. God loves us more deeply than we love ourselves. And to realize that, and it's hard to realize, that's what it means when they say God is a jealous God. It doesn't mean that God is jealous of what you do. God is a jealous lover of everybody. God wants 
everybody. In the end, I hope you don't end up offended with the metaphor, God wants to sleep with everybody, and God will. And so God is a jealous God, so that uh, that's powerfully consoling to know with your kids and loved ones and so on, God, God's not asleep here. God wants their salvation more than you do. And even at times when we're asleep to our own salvation, God isn't. Um, God, God as C.S. Lewis says, has a million traps to get you to fall into salvation. Uh, God is crafty and clever and is always working at this and so on. Um, and that undercuts a lot of our fears, sometimes not even for ourselves, sometimes for ourselves, but also for our, our kids and our grandkids and people we love who are no longer walking the, the planet with us and the, uh, at the way of faith. You know, say, God, God has them solidly on God's radar screen. Um, God is plotting their salvation. Now, finally, God is the author of all that is good. That's very, very important, again, in terms of our fears at a certain level. What's at stake here is this. We make way too many fearful distinctions kind of about who is in and about who's out. Uh, you know, who's baptized and who isn't, and you know, who's going to church and who isn't, and so on. Not that those things are incidental, but maybe I'll, I'll ask the question in this huge sense. Right now, and this is consoling, we're well over a billion Christians on this planet. So if Jesus says, unless, you know, um, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody gets to heaven except they go through me, well, there's a billion of us have a chance. But there's six billion other people. What about them? What about all the Hindus and Buddhists and non-Christians and all? What's going to happen to all of them? Um, what's going to happen to the beautiful things inside of our secular world, but they're not Christian, uh, they're not explicitly ecclesial, and so on. Well, you want this line from Scripture. Scripture says, God is the author of all that is good. That's a far-reaching statement. God is the author of all that is good, which means absolutely everything in our world that is one, true, good, and beautiful comes from God. And you know, we make too easy a distinction between the secular and the sacred. So, for instance, Mother Teresa, was a wonderful, saintly, explicitly Christian woman. What, what about the energy of an athlete? You know, some athlete in the prime of his or her career. They're just this beautiful, physical human being. Who do you think created that beauty? Nature? It's God. See, God is the author of Mother Teresa's wisdom. He's also the author of the bone structure of the movie star and the skill of the athlete. He's the author of the, the humor you see in a Jerry Seinfeld. You know, I hope when we get to heaven, you know, sometimes on retreats, I'll ask people to do this. I say, I want you to spend some time now to make a composite of how you see the face of God. When you get to heaven, you see God's face, who do you want in there? You know, and sometimes artists can do it with painting, but other people do it just with the notes and so on. Well, you want to see Mother Teresa there, and you want to see, you know, uh, your mother and dad there, but um, you also want to see Jerry Seinfeld's face there. You want to see uh, the, the beauty of movie stars. You want it all there. God's the author of all of this, and we, we have to give credit where credit is due. And, and uh, I'll give you an example. When I was living in Rome, and I forget which, it was, it was the Sydney Olympics. And we, we were watching them in our TV room. This is in Rome, in the center of the church, okay? Uh, the Albrecht House, and we're watching the opening of the Olympic Games. And remember, that's always this incredible pageant, you know, where all the fireworks and all the stars, and they, they parade the athletes in and so on. And today, that's the ultimate beauty contest on the entire planet. So it's not Miss America or Miss Universe. The Olympic Games, they put all the most beautiful bodies in the whole world on display every four years. And so we're watching this, and some of the guys were making caustic remarks. One guy said, oh, God, this is all about money. This is about corporations. This is about Pepsi and, and you know, coffee and this and that. And someone said, oh, you know, it's all, it's all skin deep, and this is beautiful, it's skin deep. And I said, but that's really some kind of a skin. <laughs> <laughs> So what's wrong with what they're doing? Because in fact, what they're saying is right. There's a lot of it commercially driven and steroids and this and that. That's not the first reaction. 
Your first reaction when you see beauty, you know what your first reaction should be? Wow, this is beautiful. It doesn't get any more beautiful than that. And God is the author of all of that beauty. Now, some of it needs channeling and disciplining and this and that and so on. But see, long before we go, oh, this is about steroids and this is about this and this. No, this is beautiful. See, for us, a lot of our fears disappear if we can just affirm the goodness and beauty in the world. Whenever you see it with whatever face it has, if it doesn't, I mean, if, if it's New Age or a Buddhist or a Hindu or a secular or whatever, if it's beautiful, it's beautiful. If it's true, it's true. If it's good, it's good. And it comes from God. Then we don't have to worry about, like, well, how is this person going to get to heaven and how do Buddhists get there and so on? Uh, it's not our job. Uh, our job is to recognize the goodness of God wherever God is. Okay, then lastly, God can and does descend into hell, the ultimate. Um, consolation to take away our fear. You know this doctrine where we say, um, and we in fact we restored it in the creed. That's one of the changes I really appreciated. Where now we say in the Apostles' Creed again, he descended into hell. When I was a kid we had God descending into hell, then we, for 30 years we had him going to the dead, and now he's going back to hell. Okay. <laughs> but I, I like that line. What does it mean that God descended into hell? Well, the catechetical and the iconography of that is this, that, that we believe that from the time of Adam and Eve sinning until Jesus dying, the gates of heaven were shut and nobody could go there. Abraham and Sarah and Rachel and Jacob and Moses and David and all of them, they had to wait until then when Jesus died, during the time of his, from Good Friday to, to Easter Sunday, he went down to this place and he opened the gates and he let all these souls into heaven. Okay. Now, that's the catechetical thing. There's a spiritual take on that which comes from great saints, from Gregory of Nyssa through more recently people like von Balthasar and so on, um, who explained it this way. He said, this is the most consoling doctrine in all of religion. And it means this. It means that no matter what kind of hell that we can go into, God can get there and breathe out peace. In fact, if you want the biblical image of that, take this. John chapter 20, and that's the resurrection in, in Christ, in, in John's gospel. They say on the morning of the resurrection, the disciples were all huddled in a room with locked doors for fear of the Jews and the authorities. They said, and then as they're huddled in this fear, they said, Jesus came right through the locked door, stood in the middle, and he breathed out peace. He said, peace be with you. I say it again, peace be with you. Now. Notice he came through the locked door. There's a famous painting by um, an artist called Holman Hunt, and many of us have seen knockoff pictures of this. Um, you know, but it's the famous picture of the Jesus who knocks. And remember, there's a, a man, he's huddled inside of kind of a darkened room, and there's a big oak door, and Jesus is outside the oak door, gently knocking on the door with a lantern. But there's only a doorknob on the inside. And the idea is he has to open this door and then Jesus can come out. Now, that's beautiful, but it doesn't get the Gospels. You know? Because in the Gospels, notice Jesus doesn't stand and lock, knock on the locked door. He comes right through the locked door and he stands in the middle. Some years ago, and you all have your own stories, and I was still teaching in Edmonton, I knew a young woman, she was 21 years old, and um, she attempted suicide. She's going to the University of the United States and her family flew her home and for the next three months they surrounded her with the best psychiatry, the best doctors, the best love, the best they could reach out. They couldn't reach her. After three months she killed herself. She had got into, into some kind of private hell or space of depression into which no human psychiatry, no human uh, love, no human doctoring could get into there. She died like that. But you can be sure when she woke on the other side, Jesus was standing in the middle saying, peace be with you. See, this is consoling because we, or our loved ones, or people can get into a space where no psychiatry, doctor, love, spirituality can ever penetrate anymore. And sometimes we die like that. Our doctor, we say, the way Jesus died, he revealed the love that can go through right into hell itself. In probably the single most powerful confession I ever heard of a man, and he had done some bad things, but he was repentant, and he says, Father, he said, 
I was in hell and I realized God hadn't stopped loving me for one second. See, um, when we realize that, that's the ultimate consolation and ultimately takes away our deep fears. I was preaching once in a church in Rome, no less, on this, that was the text. And during the homily I said, uh, this is the most consoling doctrine in all of religion. I said, not just in Christianity, in all of religion. Well, I was investing in the sacristy, the man came and says, where in the heck do you get off making an arrogant statement like that? I said, because it's true. I said, you know, I don't understand Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism perfectly, but I know them enough to know what's there. But if you can find in any of those religions anything that approximates this, I'll take that homily back, because you won't find it there. First of all, the only place you're going to find it is in, because Hinduism, Taoism, um, and uh, Buddhism are wonderful religions, but they're religions that don't have a redemptive thing, so you have to come back and do your lives over to get it right. So there is no theology of redemption. But you do have it in Judaism, Islam, and ourselves, and we only have it here, where, see, that the powerful piece in Christianity is precisely, at a certain point, you try your best and you don't have to do it yourself. Christ can reach you when you can't reach yourself anymore. When you are too helpless to open the door, Christ can still open the door for you. And incidentally, that's why we don't believe in reincarnation. Christians don't believe in reincarnation because we don't need it. You don't have to come back and get your life right. You just have to try it the best that you can. And realizing that is the ultimate consolation. Julian of Norwich says, then you realize in the end, all will be well and all will be well and every manner of being will be well. I want to end by reading you a poem from um, Jane Tyson Clement, and she was a member of the Bruderheim community of uh, the Mennonites. And this is a wonderful piece called Vigil. It said, What would I do, O Master, if you came slowly out of the woods? Would I know you by your step? Would I know you by my own beating heart? Would I know you by your eyes? Would I feel on my shoulder too the burden you carry? Would I rise and stand still till you draw near? Or would I cover my eyes in shame? Or would I simply forget everything except the fact that you came and you are here? Would I simply forget everything except the fact that you came and you were here? That's the way we meet God without fear.